Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the Administration's Fiscal Year 2018 Budget Request. We welcome Secretary Mattis for the first time before our committee, and we welcome Chairman Dunford back. The question today, as it is each year for this hearing, is how well the administration's proposal meets the security needs of the nation, factoring in both the external threats and the current state of our military. This committee has repeatedly heard testimony over the past two years that our country faces more serious, complex security challenges now than we have ever faced before. And the hearings and briefings we have held on the current state of our military have been disturbing. The administration's budget request of $603 billion for base requirements is 6% above the 17 enacted level and 3% above the last Obama administration budget proposal. It's also $37 billion below what this committee assessed last fall was needed and about $58 billion below the FY12 Gates budget, which was independently validated by the Bipartisan National Defense Panel. But of course, the issue is not about numbers. The issue is about what those numbers provide for the men and women who serve and what security the budget provides to the nation. It's about whether we can defend the U.S. and our allies against North Korean missiles, for example. It's about whether we have the number of ships and planes and other military capability to deter aggression and maintain peace. It's about doing right by our most valuable asset, our people. The men and women who serve deserve the best weapons and equipment our country can provide, and I'm afraid today they're not getting it. It's always tempting to divert this discussion into a broader budget debate about taxes and other spending issues. Those issues are not within the jurisdiction of this committee or of these witnesses. But regardless of our views on those other issues, we cannot wait until we solve our budget problems to adequately fund our military. We cannot wait until we perfect our acquisition system to have planes that fly and ships that sail. The world is not stopping and waiting on us to get our act together. It moves on, and it's moving on in a dangerous direction. 2018 is a key decision point. We've spent six years just getting by, asking more and more of those who serve and putting off the choices that have to be made. We cannot keep piling missions on our service members without ensuring they have all they need to succeed. Does the administration's budget propose, proposal accomplish that goal? That is the question we intend to examine tonight. I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Smith, for any comments he'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I agree with much of what you said, and I think the, the best way to sum it up is what you said about putting off choices. That that's what we've done for quite a while, and not just on the defense budget, but on our you know, tax reform, on all aspects of the budget as well. And I think the, the impact on the military is as the chairman describes. And the real problem we have right now is a major disconnect between what we would like to do and the amount of money that we're prepared to do it. As the chairman mentioned, even the president's budget at 603 does not match what our committee assessed was needed, I think even more tellingly, it doesn't match what the president has said he's going to do. In fact, it is very, very distant from that. If you talk about a 350-ship Navy, a, I think 570,000-person Army, you talk about all the planes, all the nuclear modernization that they want to do, I, I don't even begin to know what the yearly number would be to get to that. I'm suspecting it's well north of seven, eight hundred billion dollars. So we have all these grand ideas of what we want. We don't have the money to get there. And who's left in the lurch? The people that you serve, the men and women of the military, are left with missions that they don't have the resources to fulfill. And I think we have to start making choices. And I've got a bit of a preview of your opening remarks, and I agree with you. Certainly, the House of Representatives is in no position to lecture you about making choices. We don't have a budget. It's the middle of June. I've been here 20 years. We have never gone this long without providing numbers. Uh, to, to spend money that doesn't count, 
something. But we've got to make choices. We've got to decide what we're going to fund. And I will disagree with the chairman on one issue, and that is the notion that somehow, as the Armed Services Committee, everything else that goes on in the budget really doesn't have anything to do with us, so we shouldn't worry about it. One thing most certainly does, and that is revenue. Because how much money you have, in my experience anyway, has a profound impact on how much money you are able to spend. You know, I'll skip for the moment the argument about the Department of Homeland Security and how important the State Department is, why I lied, I didn't skip it. But I think all of those things are important. But if you just want to get right down to the basics, even if you just want to say forget about all that, all we're concerned about is the Armed Services Committee and providing for the men and women in our military the, the resources that they need, the planes, the ships, the equipment, the training, the readiness, all of that, it is nonsensical to say that the amount of revenue we have available doesn't impact that. It absolutely does. And if we're talking about putting together, and I use we loosely here, a tax reform proposal that's going to further cut taxes by 2 to $3 trillion, and if there are members of this committee who want to support that and then want to keep coming back to this committee and talking about how terrible it is that we don't fund our military, I think that is a huge inconsistency that we need to reconcile. We have clear needs in the Defense Department. Let's make sure we provide the money for them. If we're not prepared to provide the money for them, then we need to come up with a different set of strategies, which I agree with the chairman, would be very difficult. We have a very complex threat environment from North Korea to Iran to Russia um, to a rising China to not to mention the terrorist groups that are still out there and active. So it would be difficult to redo that strategy. But we'd be better off doing that than to have a strategy that we have no intention of funding. And right now, that's kind of what the executive branch looks like they're doing. They have a strategy that they have no intention of funding. We, we have to fix that. Just two quick things, and I'll ask questions about this when we get the chance. Uh, I think countering what Russia is doing is an enormously important step for us. They are in a very comprehensive effort to undermine the very values that our country has fought for in the post-World War II environment. They have an incredibly complicated cyber effort propaganda effort. They are doing all of this stuff to, to basically foster authoritarian regimes at the expense of democracies and to undermine alliances that the U.S. has relied on in that post-World War II uh, world to maintain peace and security and to protect our interests. I think we need a strategy on that. And I will be very curious to get your take on exactly what we are doing in Qatar. You, we hear what the Secretary of State says about it, and mere hours later, the President says something diametrically opposed to that. It is a very destabilizing situation right now in the Middle East. I agree with the Secretary of State. We should be finding ways to solve that problem, not ways to throw gasoline on the fire. But I'm just not clear what the administration's strategy is. And considering the fact that CENTCOM is located in Qatar, I would think that, Mr. Secretary, you would have some opinions on what we ought to do to try to resolve that situation. And I would look forward to that comment. And with that, I yield back and look forward to your testimony. The committee is pleased to welcome the Honorable James M. Mattis, Secretary of Defense, General Joseph F. Dumper, Jr., Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Mr. David Norton. Objection, any written comments you'd like to make will be included in the record. Mr. Secretary, the floor is yours. Well, Chairman Thornberry, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of the President's budget request for fiscal year 2018 and I appreciate the committee accepting my written statement for the record. I am joined by Chairman Dunford and the Department's new Comptroller Under Secretary of Defense David Norquist. As noted by the uh, Chairman, he's new, but he will be vital to gaining your confidence that we know where our money is going once you give it to us uh, through a good audit. This budget request holds me accountable to the men and women of the Department of Defense. Every day, more than two million service members and nearly one million civilians do their duty honoring previous generations of veterans and civil servants who have sacrificed for our country, and it's a privilege to serve alongside them. We in the Department of Defense are keenly aware of the sacrifices made by the American people to fund our military. Many times in the past, we have looked reality in the eye, met challenges with the help of congressional leadership, and built the most capable warfighting force in the world. There is no room for complacency, however, and we have no God-given right to victory on the battlefield. Each generation of Americans, from the halls of Congress to the battlefields, earns victory through commitment and sacrifice. 
And yet, for four years, the Department of Defense has been subject to or threatened by automatic across-the-board cuts as a result of sequester, a mechanism meant to be so injurious to the military it would never go into effect. But it did go into effect, and as forecast by then Secretary of Defense Panetta, the damage has been severe. In addition, during nine of the past 10 years, Congress has enacted 30 separate continuing resolutions to fund the departments, thus inhibiting our readiness and adaptation to new challenges. We need bipartisan support for this budget request. In the past, by failing to pass a budget on time or eliminate the threat of sequestration, Congress sidelined itself from its active constitutional oversight role. Continuing resolutions coupled with sequestration blocked new programs, prevented service growth, stalled industry initiative, and placed troops at greater risk. Despite the tremendous efforts of this committee, Congress as a whole has met the present challenge with lassitude, not leadership. I retired from military service three months after sequestration took effect. Four years later, I've returned to the department and I have been shocked by what I've seen about our readiness to fight. While nothing can compare to the heartache caused by the loss of our troops during these wars, no enemy in the field has done more to harm the combat readiness of our military than sequestration. We have only sustained our ability to meet America's commitments abroad because our troops have stoically shouldered a much greater burden. But our troops' stoic commitment cannot reduce the growing risk. It took us years to get into this situation. It will require years of stable budgets and increased funding to get out of it. I urge members of this committee and Congress to achieve three goals. First, fully fund our request which required an increase to the defense budget caps. Second, passed an FY 2018 budget in a timely manner to avoid yet another harmful continuing resolution. And third, eliminate the threat of future sequestration cuts so we can provide a stable budgetary planning horizon. Stable budgets and increased funding are necessary because of four external forces acting on the department at the same time. The first force that we must recognize is 16 years of war. When Congress approved the all-volunteer force in 1973, our country never envisioned sending our military to war for more than a decade without pause or conscription. America's long war has placed a heavy burden on men and women in uniform and their families. A second concurrent force acting on the department is the worsening global security situation. We must look reality in the eye. Russia and China are seeking veto power over the economic, diplomatic, and security decisions on their periphery. North Korea's reckless rhetoric and provocative actions continue despite United Nations censure and sanctions, while Iran remains the largest long-term challenge to Mideast stability. All the while, terrorist groups murder the innocent and threaten peace in many regions and target us. A third force acting on the department is adversaries actively contesting America's capabilities. For decades, the United States enjoyed uncontested or dominant superiority in every operating domain or realm. We could generally deploy our forces when we wanted, assemble them where we wanted, and operate how we wanted. Today, every operating domain including outer space, air, sea, undersea, land, and cyberspace, is contested. A fourth concurrent force is rapid technological change. Among the other forces noted this far, technological change is one that necessitates new investment, innovative approaches, and new program starts that have been denied us by law when we have been forced to operate under continuing resolutions. Each of these four forces 16 years of war, the worsening security environment, contested operations in multiple domains, and the rapid pace of technological change requires stable budgets and increased funding to provide for the protection of our citizens and for the survival of our freedoms. I reiterate that security and solvency are my watchwords as Secretary of Defense. The fundamental responsibility of our government is to defend the American people, 
providing for our security, and we cannot defend America and help others if our nation is not both strong and solvent. So we in the Department of Defense owe it to the American public and to the Congress to ensure we spend every dollar wisely. President Trump has nominated for Senate approval specific individuals who will bring proven skills to discipline our department's fiscal processes to ensure we do so. This first step into restoring readiness is underway. Thanks to Congress's willingness to support the administration request for an additional $21 billion in resources for fiscal year 2017 to address vital warfighting readiness shortfalls. Your support put more aircraft and more ships to sea and more troops in the field to train. However, we all recognize that it will take a number of years of higher funding delivered on time To strengthen the military, President Trump requested a $639 billion top line for the 2018 defense budget. This budget reflects five priorities. First priority is continuing to improve warfighter readiness begun in FY 2017, filling in the holes from trade-offs made during 16 years of war, nine years of continuing resolutions, and Budget Control Act caps. The second priority is increasing capacity and lethality while preparing for future investment driven by results from the National Defense Strategy. Our 2018 budget request ensures the nation's current nuclear deterrent will be sustained and supports continuation of its much needed modernization process. The third priority is reforming how the department does business. I am devoted to gaining full value from every taxpayer dollar spent on defense thereby earning the trust of Congress and the American people. We have begun implementation of a range of reform initiatives directed by the 2017 National Defense Authorization Act and are on track to enter into a full agency-wide financial statement audit as required by statute. I urge Congress to support the department's request for authority to conduct a 2021 base realignment and closure or BRAC round. I recognize the careful deliberation that members must exercise in considering it. Programs are essential to fielding the talent we need to sustain our competitive advantage on the battlefield. The fifth priority is support for overseas contingency operations. The FY 2018 President's budget requests $64.6 .6 billion, focusing on operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria increasing efforts to sustain NATO's defenses to deter aggression and global counterterrorism operations. ISIS and other terrorist organizations represent a clear and present danger, and I am encouraged by the willingness of our allies and partners to share the burden of this campaign. Moving forward, the FY 2019 budget, informed by the new national defense strategy, will have to make hard choices as we shape the FY 2019 to 2023 defense program. The department will work with President Trump, Congress, and this committee to ensure future budget requests are sustainable and provide the commander in chief with viable military options that support America's security. I am keenly aware that each of you understands the responsibility we share to ensure our military is ready to fight today and in the future. I need your help to inform your fellow members of Congress about the reality facing our military and the need for Congress as a whole to pass a budget on time. Thank you for your strong support over many years and for ensuring our troops have the resources and equipment they need to fight and win on the battlefield. I pledge to collaborate closely with you for the defense of our nation and our joint effort to keep our armed forces second to none. Chairman Dunford is prepared to discuss the military dimensions of the budget request. Mr. Chairman. The Chairman Thornberry, Ranking Member Smith, distinguished members of the committee, it's an honor to join Secretary Mattis and Under Secretary Norquist here tonight. I'm honored to represent your men and women in uniform, and it's because of them I can begin by saying with confidence that your armed forces today are the most capable in the world. However, the competitive advantage that the United States military has long enjoyed is eroding. A number of factors have contributed to that erosion. Since 9-11, an extraordinarily high operational tempo has accelerated the wear and tear of our weapons and equipment. Meanwhile, budget instability and the Budget Control Act have forced the department to operate with far fewer resources than required for the strategy of record. 
As a consequence, we prioritize near-term readiness at the expense of replacing aged equipment and capability development. We've also maintained a force that consumes readiness as fast as we build it. We lack sufficient capacity to meet current operational requirements while rebuilding and maintaining full spectrum readiness. You know, Secretary and the service chiefs have addressed that dynamic in their testimonies, and I, and I fully concur, concur with their assessments. But beyond the current readiness, we're confronted with another significant challenge that I assess to be near term. While we've been primarily focused on the threat of violent extremism, our adversaries and potential adversaries have developed advanced capabilities and operational approaches, and these are specifically designed to limit our ability to project power. They recognize that our ability to project power is the critical capability necessary to defend the homeland, advance, advance our interests, and meet our alliance commitments. Secretary Mattis alluded to it today, Russia, China, and Iran field a wide range of cyber, space, aviation, maritime, and land capabilities, and these are specifically designed to limit our ability to deploy, employ, and sustain our forces. Russia and China have also modernized the nuclear arsenal, while North Korea has been on a relentless path to field a nuclear ICBM that can reach the United States. In just a few years, if we don't change the trajectory, we'll lose our qualitative and quantitative competitive advantage. The consequences will be profound. It will adversely affect our nuclear deterrence, our conventional deterrence, and our ability to respond if deterrence fails. Alternatively, we can maintain our competitive advantage with sustained, sufficient, and predictable funding. To that end, the FY18 budget is an essential step. However, this request alone will not fully restore readiness or arrest the erosion of our competitive advantage. Doing this will require a sustained investment beyond FY18. Specific recommendations for FY19 and beyond will be informed by the forthcoming strategy development. However, we know now that continued growth in the base budget, or at least 3% above inflation, is the floor necessary to preserve today's relative competitive advantage. We ask for your support, and while we do that, we recognize the responsibility to maintain the trust of the American taxpayer. We take that seriously and will continue to eliminate redundancies and achieve efficiencies where possible. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you, and more importantly, thanks for ensuring that America's sons and daughters are never in a fair fight. With that, I'm ready for your questions. Thank you, sir. Mr. Norquist, do you have a statement you'd like to make? Thank you. Um, let me just alert members that under the circumstances, I think it's important to hold members to the five-minute rule, um, and therefore, short direct questions will, I have no doubt with these witnesses, evoke short direct uh, answers. Uh, they're known for that. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and put me on, on the clock, please. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, when, when the budget came to Congress on May 23rd, I think other than the past week, you were the only Senate confirmed person in the Department of Defense. Um, and uh, of, of the Trump administration. And, and if you look at that uh, budget request, it has basically the same number of ships and planes, uh, no change in end strength for the Army and Marines that, uh, that had already been planned. So is it fair to say that essentially what uh, has been sent to us for FY18 is what was already in the works with some minor adjustments. Chairman, <clears throat> excuse me, Chairman, what we attempted to do with the FY17 supplemental was to fill in as many of the holes in our readiness as possible. <clears throat> with $21 uh, billion, we were unable to fill them all. So part of what we're doing, admittedly, right now is continuing to fill in holes. But the growth that we're developing right now this year is into areas where we balance the force. In other words, we've got to bring in more cyber troops. We need to do some things to expand where we've already got gaps that we cannot simply repair our way out of. Uh, we've got to actually buy some new equipment, this sort of thing. So we are still in getting the force back on its feet, a force that you've paid a lot of money for, but it was not maintained at full readiness, sir. 
Well, and, and just following up on Mr. Smith's point, uh, the President has said specifically he'd like to have a Navy of 350 ships. Uh, he's talked about 12 aircraft carriers. He talked about Army in strength of 540,000. He's talked about increasing the number of fighter aircraft and so forth. So, so for this budget in 18 that we've gotten so far, it does not really advance any of those goals, does it? Uh, Sir, it gets us in the right direction. As the chairman and I said, it's going to take 3 to 5 percent in the future to actually grow the force along the lines of what you're talking about. But I would also point out that this is $52 billion above the BCA cap. And that's not something that we can simply walk in and ignore, uh, knowing it's a reality that you have to deal with. Yeah, I, I just editorially comment. I don't think anybody thinks the BCA cap is is uh, anywhere appropriate to what we need for our for our military, and that's what we're trying to focus on. Let me just ask you one other question about this. Um, again, the, the White House talks about developing state-of-the-art missile missile defense systems, and I I think the biggest surprise to me was to look at the budget for the missile defense agency and see that go down in 18 from what it is in 17. Can you explain that to me? Uh, sir, it's a worsening situation. We have a ballistic missile defense review underway, uh, what, but right now I'm confident that we have what it takes to secure us against the North Korean threat and buy us some time until we can get the review done and come to you with a defensible, sustainable ballistic missile defense buildup. Hmm. Uh, Chairman Dunford, uh, you talked about uh, that the 18 budget does not fill all the readiness holes. Secretary just testified that he was shocked when he came back into the department and saw the state of our readiness. I looked through all of the services unfunded requirements, uh, which they are required to give by statute, and there's a lot of readiness in those unfunded requirements. So it is true, is it not, that if there is additional funds above the president's request, especially on readiness, that those funds can be well used. Would you agree with that? Chairman, I would, and, and I think it's important at this point to realize that, you know, where traditionally readiness has been considered just operations and maintenance money, when you have a squadron that has only six of the primary aircraft authorized that it rates, you can only have those aircraft so ready, and it's still not going to make a difference. The squadron's still 50 percent ready. So I would just argue that there's really maybe this year now, as a result of the last several years, in many cases, there's a distinction without a difference between readiness and procurement. In many cases, procurement is necessary in order to get units ready. I, I think that's what's, what's uh, a, a point that we've learned over the past year as well. Uh, thank you. I'd yield to Mr. Smith. Thank you. I'm just wondering, has anyone added up all of the President's promises in terms of defense, as the Chairman and I have outlined some of them? And is there any notion of what it would cost to meet those goals in a five-year plan? If I'm not mistaken, there actually wasn't a FIDA offered by the President's budget, which is unusual. Um, and I can't help but think that it's because – and you can start the clock on me, sorry. Um, I can't help but think that that's because you, you didn't want to look at it um, and see just how outlandish those numbers would be versus the money we have. So do you have a number? I mean, if you have five-year numbers to, to begin to get to what we're talk, what the, what the president has talked about, I do not, sir. We've been we've been digging down into what we can do right now to get the force ready in its current situation uh, that we confront. I think there's pretty common understanding here that uh, that the force is going to have to be improved. That's the common ground we have, and we're going to have to move out smartly and in concert with the uh, the Congress as we sort out what can be done and what the targets are. Right. Well, I, I would suggest, as I said in my opening remarks, that we get more realistic about that. I don't think it serves any particular purpose to make promises that nobody has any intention of keeping. So if we could down that to something that's reasonable. And with that, let me just say, one of the things I, I hope that the NDA is able to do is when we're on the floor, we have an amendment to repeal the BCA and the budget caps. And I would urge in a bipartisan way that we, we try to get that out there on the floor and let, let members take that vote. Because the Budget Control Act was six years ago. It was passed with the goal of reaching a grand bargain. That didn't happen. It's irrelevant. 
Now, that's not to say that a $20 trillion debt and a $700 billion deficit is not a problem. It's just that it's obvious the Budget Control Act is a terrible way to go about trying to address it. Can you help me out on the Qatar question that I raised earlier? Now, I certainly do understand that Qatar has a mixed record, but you know, we're doing this primarily at the behest of Saudi Arabia. And if you want to talk about a mixed record, they have a pretty mixed record, too. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers. Uh, Wahhabism is one of the more extreme forms of Islam. They funded madrasas all across the Middle East and South Asia and North Africa. And now I have met with the foreign minister. I've been assured that they are, they are trying to reform and move in a more positive direction. But it just seems odd that we're working with Saudi Arabia to go after Qatar because Qatar is doing too much to support groups that are radical extremists. So what's going on over there and what should our policy be? Sir, it's a very complex situation. You know, each of those countries manifests its own trajectory of forward progress. Uh, I would tell you that there is common ground, uh, and that is something President Trump was attempting to uh, generate and reinforce with the trip that we recently witnessed. Uh, in that regard, uh, you see Qatar itself, for example, uh, houses the largest single uh, air base that we have and the headquarters, the forward headquarters, for our Air Force, our Central Command, and our Special Operations. I would simply point out that we have interoperability uh, capability with Qatar, and I believe that Prince Thani inherited uh, a difficult, very tough situation, and he's trying to uh, turn uh, the society in the right direction, but we all agree that funding of any kind of terrorist group is uh, inimical to all of our interests, and I believe that it's moving in the right direction. We've got to try and help sort this out with them all. Well, why the disconnect between what Secretary of State Tillerson has said about the situation and what the President has said about it? Sir, I, I believe that the President coming back from the Middle East uh, was uh, extremely uh, focused uh, on what they had done in order to try to get everyone to agree on how we would stop the funding of the, uh, of the enemy groups to include, at times, gray funding. In other words, it's not black and white. It goes into some kind of nebulous area right. and shows up there. So what you're seeing is a continued focus on that. At the same time, uh, we've obviously got shared interest with Qatar that, again, hosts the biggest base uh, that we have there. Uh, so it's one of those areas where we've got to find the common ground, make common ground, and move out together, and, it's, and it has been a challenge. It's not tidy. I will admit it's not tidy, just, but it's something that we've got to work together on. And just a couple quick comments before my time runs out. One, that Saudi Arabia is a country that we also have to work on that issue. Because while, I mean, they've cut this deal, they'll support the Wahhabism version of the religion as long as they don't get violent, the Wahhabism version of the religion pushes you right up to the edge of that violence and in some would argue is the logical conclusion of it. So I think we need to put pressure on Qatar. Certainly, we really need to put pressure on Saudi Arabia to stop the spread of that ideology. And I will assume that one of my other colleagues will ask the question about Russia. We lack a comprehensive strategy to counter what they are doing. Um, I would like an update on are we going to develop one? Do you see that as a critical need? Am I being, you know, alarmist about r what Russia is attempting to do in so many parts of the world? So I'd be curious about your comments on that, but I'll leave that to, to, to my colleagues to follow up on and yield back my time. Mr. Lobiondo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Mattis, General Dumford, thank you for being here and for your service. Uh, funding for Cyber Warfare Command and U.S. Cyber Command has been protected in the budget since 2013. Um, this has been a very high priority for me, given responsibilities on both this committee and the House Intelligence Committee. Admiral Rogers testified recently uh, that, and I'm quoting, to execute our missions, I requested a budget of approximately $647 million for fiscal year 18, which is nearly 16 percent in increase from fiscal year 17. However, cuts to the services impact our cyber warfare capabilities. Cyber operations to counter ISIS are funded via OCO, which could represent a hollow forces structure, and cyber capability and readiness gaps still exist for a European command against Russia and U.S. Pacific command against China and North Korea. 
Uh, General Dumford, for you, could you describe the readiness of our cyber forces to carry out the variety of missions they need to conduct around the world? I can, Congressman. Thank you. We uh, identified a requirement for 133 cyber mission teams, and that was done in conjunction with U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, right now, 70 percent of those teams are what we call full, fully operational capable. So they've had all the manning, they have all the training, and they're fully operational capable. The balance of the 133 teams uh, are in initial operational capability, and they will be in the coming months fully operational, ca fully operational capable. So we're, we're moving towards those 133 teams being there. But I think, I think none of us are complacent with where we are uh, in cyberspace, given the, the number of threats we face every day. We need to, to defend the network, develop effective offensive tools, and be in a position to grow the force. And, and Congressman, I think in FY18 and, and in 17, for that matter, we began to reverse a trend that for over the past five years in areas like space, cyberspace, electronic warfare, we have been underfunded. This year is the second year in a row where we have increased our resources to Cyber Command. And uh, as a follow-up, General, right now we are conducting operations against ISIS, but do we have the capacity to ramp up for additional operations against a different adversary simultaneously if required? Uh, we do, Congressman, and without going through details, we're actually simultaneously conducting cyber operations now against multiple adversaries. And can we handle the current level of aggressive cyber activity to counter Russia, North Korea, China, Iran, and others that we are seeing today? We, we need to continue to grow the force to be able to deal with those emerging threats, Congressman. Uh, can you talk to us about what we are doing to track people and support cyber as a career field? to attract people and support cyber as a career field? Congressman, I, I know Admiral Rogers has worked very hard on that, as have the services, and uh, I think there's a combination of incentives uh, as well as going out there and recruiting high-quality people and then setting good conditions for them to be retained. But that's something that we're working on very hard as well. So we are looking at things such as incentive, pay, or bonuses to attract and keep key cyber professionals? We're actually using those tools now, Congressman, and always monitoring the force to make sure to what extent we need to increase use of those tools. Okay. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for being here as well. Secretary Mattis, I know in your testimony you spoke about the three million service members and civilians that make up the Department of Defense, and I certainly agree with you and agree with my colleagues that this, this committee cannot be expected to, to deal with all the issues that we face today. But the reality is that the people who come into our service, the men and women, they came from somewhere. You know, they were educated. Perhaps their families were on food stamps at one time. They got federal student loans. How do we reconcile, and in your position where I think you have such a strong voice in this, how do you work with those issues while we're struggling here to defund defense, appropriately and looking at the, all of our readiness issues. And at the same time, we see that the president is cutting uh, many of the programs that service the people who actually are in the, in the military. We know that over a third kids uh, are obese today and they can't serve. They're not able to serve because they have um, they had drug addictions. There, there are so many issues that we kind of put them over there and say, well, those don't really relate to our military and certainly not to our national security. I know you've, you've thought about this issue and how do, what is the role that you see yourself playing even within the cabinet to try and, and have people focus on these issues? Well, Congresswoman, I, as you know, I'm, I'm not shy about speaking up. Uh, I would tell you that we are meeting our own quality uh, demands right now. We have not had to lower our standards at all, but you're, you're absolutely accurate that uh, we have a, a shrinking percentage of our 18-year-old, 20-year-old, that population we do a lot of recruiting from. We have a shrinking percentage that can qualify to enlist in the Army, for example, as a private. So I would take no issue with it. Uh, yeah, I think it's all of our responsibilities, uh, whether, whether we're in the executive branch, legislative, or we're a local school district member, uh, but it's not one that I can speak about with authority. I, I've been rather consumed, as you'll understand, with the portfolio I have, but I don't take any issue with what you're saying. So far, I will tell you, uh, it has not inhibited our quest for high-quality young men and women who are, are rallying to the flag. Do you hear other voices speaking up on this, on this room? Absolutely. 
Okay. Well, I, I hope so, and I, I appreciate your, your doing that as well. I wonder if you could just turn to a second, and, and, and certainly general as well, and just speak to us about your current thinking on Afghanistan. Uh, as I think that the public is aware, it's becoming, feels much more chaotic uh, and, and violent, and there are very few options for us. What do you see as the status, and, and where can we go with this? Uh, Congresswoman, we are taking a, uh, a regional approach to this. We're looking at everything from the situation between India and Pakistan, Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, obviously uh, Iran, that whole South Asia area, because if we look at it in isolation, we'll probably have something that's lacking in some area. We are going to have to recognize that problems that come out of ungoverned spaces like that, as we experienced on 9-11, those problems do not stay there. They, they can come home to roost here. So there will be no, uh, no turning a blind eye to it. We've got to determine uh, what level of support is necessary and how we orchestrate the international community, not just the American, but the international community, to deal with this. Uh, we'll take that forward to the President for a decision very soon. And General Dunford, I know that you serve very actively there as well. Do, you, do the numbers that are being talked about, and are those in isolation from other tools in our, in our toolbox, essentially? Do we Congress, need to be doing Congress something will, else with civilians? Sure. We've, we've listened very carefully to, to General Nicholson's uh, assessment of the situation. I think we're all concerned about the security trends over the last two years, not the least of which is the significant number of casualties the Afghan forces have suffered. So we've gone to Secretary Mattis uh, and the President with some options uh, that, that might be considered in order to reverse those trends. Uh, but as the Secretary said, uh, we'll consider Afghanistan in the broader context of a regional strategy as well. But we do have some things that we're considering to, uh, to turn around the trends and better enable the Afghan security forces who, as you know, have been in the lead for the last two years providing security for their country. So this is not about us uh, being in the fight. It's about us doing things for the Afghans to be more successful than they have been over the last two summers. Do you, do you have the resources that you need? both in the military and on uh, the civilian side? It, as you suggested, Congresswoman, it, it, the options will include not just, it's not just about numbers of troops, it's about authorities, it's about other things we can do diplomatically and economically as well. Thank you. 